God's grace and mercy be with you on this evening. It is just a few moments now after 7 p.m. here on the West Coast, and it's time to begin our Bible study. I pray that all is well for each one of you and that uh, you are walking in victory on tonight. I do want to begin our Bible study with our devotion. Uh, we have a scripture that we share with you on each Wednesday evening with the hope that it can give some focus and some insight to you as you are preparing yourself for our lesson on tonight. Tonight, uh, the word of God that we'll be sharing with you is from the book of Luke, St. Luke, chapter number, uh, chapter number six. Uh, chapter number six in the book of St. Luke. And as I mentioned to you, I typically share from the King James Version, but you're welcome to use any translation that you have. I'm going to be reading from verse number 27 down through verse 25. And tonight's lesson and in our devotion is intended to remind us of how we reflect Christ in our relationship with others. When you are a born again believer, it ought to impact not only your relationship with God, but it ought to also affect how you interact with others. In particular, tonight's devotion is intended to remind us that it is those who are the hardest for us to deal with that ought to be the most responsive to our faith. People who are the most difficult ought to be the first ones to notice that there is something different about us. So our relationship with the Lord ought to impact our interactions with others. Our devotion is taken from St. Luke chapter number six, verse number 27 as we begin our reading through verse 35, and it reads, But I say unto you that here, love your enemies, do good to them who hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them who despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that ask of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them. For if you love them who love you, what thanks have ye? For sinners also love those who love them. And if you do good to them who do good to you, what thanks have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thanks have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Verse 35, our final verse. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again and your reward shall be great and ye shall be the sons of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. This morning's devotion, this evening's devotion is intended to simply be a reminder that our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with God is best reflected, is best reflected not in the number of times that we praise him, not in the number of scriptures that we recite, or even the number of Bible studies that we attend. The best reflection of our relationship with the Lord is in our interactions with others. This is how we reflect the love of God best. In particular, it isn't simply our response to those who show us love and kindness, but it's our response to those who despitefully use us, who mistreat us, 
who make light of us. As a Christian, our best way to shine the light of God is by shining that light in the darkest of places. That light is most needed in the darkest of places. Our tendency is to want to shine our light where other lights are already shining brightly, where there is love, where there is friendliness, where there is good cheer. There's no difficulty shining your light in that space. But our scripture tonight says, the best reflection of my relationship with God is that I am willing to let my light shine in the darkest of places. That's where it's needed most. Your light, my light, our light is needed most among those who do not know him, among those who despitefully use us, among those who may demean us or make light of us. This is the measure of your relationship with the Lord. The Lord says, what good is it to give to those who you know will give back? What good is it to show love to those who have already shown you love? What good is it to shine your light in a brightly lit room filled with other believers whose lights are also shining? What good is it? The Lord says, let your light shine by showing love even to your enemies also. That's the measure of our relationship with him. I'm going to pray with you tonight as we get ready to get into our study. And my prayer to God for each one of us is that our light would shine brightest in the darkest of situations, in the darkest of places around the darkest of people. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, I thank you for this evening, for the opportunity you've given to us yet again to study your word, to show ourselves approved, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I pray tonight that you would, Lord, speak to our hearts and minds, that you would help us to penetrate the depths and the mysteries of your word, and that for each of us, something will be received, a morsel, a seed will be planted that will help us, Lord, to allow that seed to grow and produce good fruit. And Lord, my prayer tonight is that every one of us will look, look forward to those moments when our light can shine most brightly in the darkest of places. This is why you've placed us here. And Lord, I pray that we will continue to do just that. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, dear Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Are you ready? Let's go into our Bible study tonight. The seven churches in the book of Revelation. Go back with me to the book of Revelation, chapter number two, as we are wrapping up the fourth, the fourth church. We only have a few things to share with you. That church is Thyatira. This is the contaminated church. The church that had been doing much good, however, they had allowed themselves to be contaminated by false doctrine and false teaching. They had embraced that because it was pleasing to their own ears. It was preferable to the, to the hard word, the hard word like what we just shared tonight from Luke chapter number six, the hard word to, to love your enemy also. That's a hard word. That's the kind of word that the people of Thyatira would not have wanted to embrace. They would have wanted to embrace the word that says that we should show love and kindness to one another. That's the easy word. But Thyatira was a church that though they had good works, they were inclined to follow a false prophetess. A Jezebel is what Jesus referred to her as. And there's consequences when you allow your mind and your spirit to be contaminated by the false teachings of those who uh, simply appeal to what is comfortable for us to hear. 
when we ended our lesson last week, I want you to go back with me now to Revelation chapter number two. We were looking at verse 24 and 25. These are the final verses surrounding the church at Thyatira, the church that had been contaminated, the church that Jesus says, in spite of the works that you've done, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. And again, as we mentioned last week, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of God with a notwithstanding. He had issues with them. And so the, the question today for each one of us is, does he have an issue with you as well? And so where we ended last week was this. There was some words that Jesus spoke to encourage those within the church community who had not yet taken in the false teaching and false doctrine of this false prophetess. Would you go back with me now to Revelation chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, as we share these last few words from this before we move forward to the next church. What does it say here in the King James Version? Turn with me if you would. Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. Are you there? All right, let's see what it says. Revelation chapter 2, and we're looking now at verse number 24 and 25. And what does it say? It says, but unto you, but unto you, I say, but unto you. Uh, let me find myself here. Okay, 24. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan. So he's talking to those few within the church community that had not embraced the false teaching, the false doctrine, the false prophecy of this false prophetess. So he says, those who have not, as many of you, as many of you who have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden but that which you have already Hold fast till I come. Where we left off last week were the following things that are important for us to take note of. Even in the midst of the contamination that surrounded that church community, Jesus had a word for those who had not submitted to this false teaching. And the word was, hold fast, hold on till I come. The word, when you are facing challenges that are confronting you, when you are facing obstacles that are upon you, when things seem to be going awry in the church, and they do, when things are going awry, what does the Lord say to the believer? He says, just hold on. Remember the things that you have. The word that Jesus gave to those who were in this church that was going down the wrong path because of false teaching, false doctrine, the word that Jesus had was this, hold on to what you have. What I shared with you last week and the week before is this, it's so very important that you study the word yourself, that you know what the word of God is. The scripture, study yourself, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed. Study, study, study. Read the word for yourself. And what Jesus says to those in this church, he doesn't say run from the church. He doesn't say go talk about the church. He doesn't say um, go out and, 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 and ridicule the church. He says, hold fast, hold fast till I come. Just hold on, remember the things that you have. Now where we left you last week was this. These are the same comments that the Lord gave to Moses uh, to share with Israel as they were getting ready to enter into the promised land. God forewarned the Israelites that when they got into this new land, there would be other teachings, there would be other gods that people would be worshiping, there would be other uh, religions, other cults. And God's word to Israel is if you're going to sustain yourself and grow and, and prosper, hold fast to what I have given. The word to the Israelites were the same words that Jesus gives to the church today. Hold fast. Let me take you back to where we left off. Deuteronomy. Go with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Uh, these are the scriptures that we left off with last week. Deuteronomy 10, verse 20 and 21. Because the reality is, 
the territory that we are about to take is filled with false doctrines, false teaching, false beliefs. And we are not to take, on, take in the things of those in the world around us. Deuteronomy 10, verse 20 and 21. Let me share with you what the Lord told, uh, the Lord God told Moses to tell the people. Verse 20, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thy serve, and to him shalt thy cleave. Cleave means to hold on, hold on, cling to. Him shalt thy cleave and swear by his name. In verse number 21, it says, he is thy praise. And he is thy God, who hath done for thee these great and awe-inspiring things which thine eyes have seen. Hold on. Cling to the things that you know. As we shared with you last week, in the midst of the challenges that Israel was about to, to, to face going into this foreign territory, in the midst of the challenges that the the, the people of God in Thyatira were facing, what God was saying to Israel applies to them, I am your praise. In the midst of what you're going through, I am your praise. Don't forget your relationship with me. Don't forget the promises that I have given to you. Don't forget the truth of the gospel. Even though there are things that are happening that are leading people astray, people are falling from the church, people are taking on false beliefs and false doctrines, people are speaking uh, the, the lie as if it were the truth and the truth as if it were a lie and people are professing false truths and fake truths and alternative truths. And people are saying that if you don't accept the mores and the norms of the times that you're living in, that you cannot be a, a person of integrity. What God says to the church, what he said to Israel, is that in the place that you are going, you will experience a great deal of challenge. Hold on. Hold on. I am your praise. Remember the promises that I have made. Be encouraged, in other words. Let's go to another scripture in Deuteronomy, chapter number 11, verse 22 through 28. Deuteronomy, chapter number 11, verse 22 through 28. And he says, the God is speaking through Moses. Uh, he gives Moses these instructions for the people of Israel. It says, for if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you, hold on to them, keep them, cleave to them, all the commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to cleave unto him. Let me just say unto you again, my brothers and sisters, the word of God is the same. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. His desire is that we cleave to him, that he be our praise, that we cleave to his promises and not accept the, the, the false doctrine, the false teaching uh, that is taking place in uh, the, the world as we see it today. Let me keep reading from verse 23. It says, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations, mightier than yourselves. Every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Praise God. It's a promise. Every place that the feet of your soul shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the rivers, the rivers Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your borders be. Verse 25, Deuteronomy chapter number 11. There shall no man be able to stand before you for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon, as he has said. God has said to his people that even though you may be small in number, even though you may only be a remnant, even though you may be the only person in the room, if you hold fast, if you hold true, to the word of God, to the teachings of God, to the promises of God. God will put dread upon others for fear of what he is doing in your life. You do not have to allow yourself to become as the world in order to conquer the world. 
God has given commandment to his people in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and even to the church at Thyatira. The Lord says, hold fast to the things which you have. Let me continue to go. Verse number 26, behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of your Lord God, which I command you, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go to after other gods which ye have not known. So even for Israel, even for Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, as they were going into the promised land, God gives essentially the same directive that he is speaking to the church at Thyatira, to those remnant, to those few. He says, hold fast, hold fast till I come. Don't allow yourself to take in these false teachings, these false doctrines. Stay true to the path that I have given to you. He spoke it to Israel in Deuteronomy. He spoke it to Thyatira in Revelation. He's speaking it today in the year of our Lord 2021. It is still God's will that we hold fast to the things that he has promised. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, let me come back to Revelation for a moment. Revelation 2, 24 and 25. But unto you, I say, unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and have not known the depths of Satan, I will put upon you no other burden, but that you already hold fast till I come. Hold fast till I come. Now, the term hold fast, the term hold fast in the King James Version, as I've read it, means to be diligent. Hold fast. Be diligent. That word means to cling to. Hold fast. Cling to. That word can also mean to cleave. For your life's sake, cleave to it. Don't let go. It can mean take a firm grasp of something. When the Lord is saying to the people who remain in Thyatira who have not taken in this doctrine, the people of the community of church of our church today who have not fallen victim to false teachings, false prophecies, uh, to the itching ears uh, for words uh, that simply appeal to the common interest of our day. These are not the desires of the Lord. There are times when his word is hard his word is not always an easy word because truth does not always sit well with those who wish to follow untruth. God's word is the truth. His way is the life. There is no other path but his path. And so it is, my friends, that as we look closely at this word uh, to hold to, it means to cling to, it means to take a firm grasp, it is based on the idea of gripping something tightly, gripping on to something tightly. The Lord has given the instructions to the people at Thyatira, to the church of today. But similarly, the Lord gave these instructions also to Joshua. For Joshua, as he was getting ready to move Israel further towards their promise, as you remember, Moses did not get them to the promised land, but Joshua was the one who was blessed to be able to bring them into the land of Canaan across the Jordan. But God gave similar instructions even to Joshua. Go with me back to Joshua chapter 22 and verse number 5. Joshua chapter 22 verse number 5. I'm reading from the King James Version. It is the notion of clinging, cleaving to the truth, to the word of God. Joshua chapter 22, verse number five. And the word of God reads, But take diligent heed, take diligent heed to do the commandments and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto them and to serve him with all your heart 
and with all your soul. The Lord God's command to Joshua, the Lord God's command to the Israelites, the Lord God's command to the Thyatira, uh, the people in Thyatira, is the same word that applies to every Christian believer today. We are to hold tightly the word of God. Not only are we to reverence his word, but we are to embrace his word, to cleave to his word, to yearn for his word. Not only his word, but look, we are to follow his lead. We are to love the Lord God. It is in this way that we can neutralize the effect of any false doctrine and false teaching that may crop in, creep in to the Christian community. When we are cleaving to God's word, we are able to neutralize the effect of any false teaching, false doctrine, false prophecy that finds its way creeping into the people of God. Holding fast involves not compromising in our relationships, behavior, or anything that might pull us away from our total commitment to God. When you're holding fast, when you're cleaving, when you are cleaving to God's word, to God's presence, to, to his spirit in you, then that means that you are not compromising in your relationship, in your behavior. You're not allowing anything that might pull you away from your total commitment to God and obedience to his word. Holding fast then offers the promise of true life when you hold fast. I'm going to share with you a scripture. You don't have to look it up. It's in Proverbs 4 and 4. Proverbs 4 and 4, uh, part B, this is in the English Standard Version. It says, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. There is life, true life, that comes from those who cling to the word of God. Yes, this is where true life comes from. Not only does it give us life, but it also reaffirms God's love for us. Remember, when God speaks to us, he speaks to us in love. He speaks to us in grace. It is not simply that we are to uh, learn his word and, 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 and recite his word. We are to embrace his word and cleave to his word because it is centered on love. And so we are to cleave to God's word, but by cleaving to God's word, we are cleaving to God's love. Because his love and his word are inseparable. His love and his word are interconnected. God is love. So we cleave to that. Romans chapter number 8, verse 35 through 39. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 35 through 39. The word of God says the following. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or disease or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Paul is asking the question because Paul is communicating the importance of cleaving not only to God's word, but God's love. Verse number 36, as it is written, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. 
we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do we get there? We get there by choosing to hold fast, to cleave, hold fast to the promises of God, hold fast to the love of God, hold fast to the word of God, hold fast to the presence of God. Let God be your praise. Let God be your praise. And in so doing, when someone steps in to try to teach or to preach a doctrine or a belief that is contrary to the truth, your spirit will not be at peace with it because you are holding fast to all of these things, as Paul says, nothing, nothing can separate you from that which you cleave to. Only by clinging to God's word and living by it can we receive the strength, power, and direction to let God accomplish his work through us and in us and keep us pure and steadfast to the end only by clinging to God's word. Cleave to God's word. Cleave to God's love. Cleave to God's presence. Let God be your praise. So Jesus going back to Revelation chapter 2 as he wraps up his letter to the church at Thyatira, goes on to list promises to those believers who cleave, who have not embraced that doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. In Revelation chapter number 2, verse 26 through 28, Jesus gives promises to us, to them, by cleaving to him. The promises that he gives are these. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and through 28, he gives promises to us if we cleave to him. The promises are, and he that overcometh, and he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end. How do you do that? By cleaving to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. Saints of God, listen. Listen. Jesus is making a promise to you. Promise is if you cleave, cleave to my word, cleave to my love, cleave to my presence. If I am your praise, then he promises a blessing. The blessing includes authority over the nations. We're talking about after the tribulation in the time that we enter into the new Jerusalem. As believers, we will rule with Christ and have authority over the nations in the heavens. We will have victory over all enemies. The Lord promises you this by cleaving. He also promises, and this is not insignificant, to those who cleave to him, he will grant you 
the morning star. The bright and morning star awaits the fateful overcomer. Who is, what is this morning star? The morning star is Jesus himself. He has granted us who cleave to him, his very person. Jesus himself is the bright and morning star. He makes a promise that we, as, as those who cleave to him, Jesus will give himself to his church and we will reign with him. We will reign with him and have fellowship together with him forever. Let's go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse number 16. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 22, verse number 16. All right, and it reads, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things. In the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Those who cleave to the Lord, those who cleave to his word, those who cleave to his love, those for whom God is their praise. We are given promises that Jesus himself proclaims. He promises that we would have authority over the nations. He promises that we will have victory over all enemies. And he promises that we will have his person, the bright and morning star. So when Jesus speaks of the fact that in Revelation chapter 2, he speaks of the fact in verse 26 through 28 that those who overcome, we will have power over nations and, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. Jesus speaks this in Revelation. It is also prophetically spoken in the book of Psalm. The fact that we will reign with Christ have authority over the nations, exercise judgment over those who persecute, over our enemies, over our adversaries. We will have the authority to exercise judgment as a believer, as a Christian. We are not just idly sitting around in heaven. We actually are given authority by Christ to rule nations and to have authority over our adversaries. Look with me, if you would, at Psalm chapter number two. So I said chapter. There are no chapters in Psalm. It is divisions, the second number of Psalm, the second number of Psalm. Even me, as much as I have read and studied, sometimes we slip up because we're so used to referring to things as chapters. There are no chapters in Psalm. They are separate little units, separate divisions. So this is the second Psalm, verses 7 through 12, I want you to look at. Second Psalm, verse 7 through 12, and it reads as follows. I declare the decree, Psalm 2, verse number 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This is speaking of Jesus. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance. Jesus is saying to those who cleave to him, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance. You will have authority. 
and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possessions. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. What does that mean? It means that you have authority and you can exercise judgment against your adversary. You have power as a believer. The Lord has promised those who cleave to him that we will have authority and power. Look at verse number 10. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and, re with rejoice, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. In other words, love God. Cleave to him. Cleave to the Lord. Cleave to his word. Cleave to his love. Cleave to his presence. Let God be your praise. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled by a little, blessed are all they who put their trust in him, in Christ, in the Lord. And so as we come back to begin to put the pieces together in these final words to Thyatira, in spite of the notwithstanding comment that Jesus brings forward in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, after he has described their work, the work going on in that community of believers, he says, notwithstanding, I have an issue with you because you have begun to embrace false teaching, false prof prophecy, false doctrine. I have an issue with you. And then he goes on to say, as we've read already, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be punishment that's going to come to the false teaching, the false prophetesses, the false preachers, the false pastors. You will endure great hardship and all of those who embrace you and your teaching your adulterers, you remember I spoke about spiritual adultery. We, he, the Lord says, you will all suffer death. And then as he wraps up this letter to the church of Thyatira, he says, to those of you that have not taken this doctrine, to those of you that have not embraced the depths of Satan, hold on till I come. Cleave till I come. Hold on to the things that I have given to you. And we share with you the text that says that God has to be your praise. Cleave to his love. Cleave to his word. Cleave to his presence. And in so doing, the Lord himself has said there's a promise for you. Hold on, my dear sister, my dear brother. Because the Lord has said in the time to come, you will rule with me. You will have my presence with you the bright and morning star and so it is as we wrap up this portion of our study from uh, the book of Thy from uh, revelation on the church of thyatira the lord reminds us in this revelation that he will repay each of us according to our deeds the payment for sin is death those who persevere in faith, who cleave, who hold on, will receive a share of Christ's messianic authority over all nations and triumph over death. Listen, the Bible says that Christian believers, we will not just be sitting idly by in heaven. Listen, the word of God says that we will not be equal to the angels. We will have a superior role in the kingdom of God to the angels. We will share in the authority of rule. Jesus said so. We will share in Christ's messianic authority over all nations and triumph over death. We are blood washed believers. We are heirs and joint heirs to the kingdom with Christ. And so it is, my friends, it is important to note as we wrap up now, we're going to wrap up this Thyatira and, and draw some comparisons. Quite some number of weeks ago, we talked about Ephesus. Ephesus 
was commended for its doctrine, but it was a church that had lost its first love, Ephesus, the first church that we studied. Ephesus was commended for its doctrine, but it had lost its first love. This church, Thyatira, is commended for its love, but it is strayed from the doctrine. You remember Jesus said to Thyatira, the latter days are greater than the first. You, 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 you're, you're emphasizing charity, service, and all of these good things, but your doctrine is wrong. The teaching is wrong. The beliefs are wrong. So Thyatira is in exactly the opposite position. They, they are emphasizing love, but their doctrine isn't right. So just as some in Thyatira's church were led astray by a false prophetess, Christians today can and do fall prey to cult leaders, occult practices, and false teaching. This church represents Christians who think as long as we love everyone, doctrine and behavior don't, do not matter. This is, the, this is, uh, this is a, a condemnation to those who simply think that loving everyone, just as we shared Luke chapter 6, love thy neighbor and so forth and so on and do good to your enemies. And we talked about how important it is to let your light shine in the darkest of places. That was our devotion when we started. But listen, love on, on, uh, is, is, is of no value if your doctrine is on, on, on false grounds. Your doctrine, your teaching has to be on the word of God. Do not go along with false teaching for appearance sake. Do not go back into ways you have been called out of or you will suffer tribulation. Do not go back into ways that you have been called out of. Remember, you have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have chosen the straight and narrow path. There's a scripture that talks about that broad path. There's many a traveler along the way, but then there is the path of Christ. It's a narrow path and there's only an occasional traveler. Do not go back to the old path that you had prior simply because it's more convenient. Let me give you a final scripture and then we're going to wrap up Thyatira. Go with me to Luke chapter number 9, verse number 62. Luke chapter number 9, verse number 62. Are you with me? Hope you, I haven't lost anyone this evening. Luke chapter 9, verse number 62. What does it say here? Jesus said to him, Jesus says to him, to us, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, don't go back into ways you have been called out of or you will suffer tribulation. Cleave to his word. Cleave to his love. Cleave to his presence. Let God be your praise. And you will not fall victim to false doctrine, false teaching, and false prophecy. Study the word yourself. Know the word of God. The next letter in the book of Revelation to the next church, the fifth church, is found in the third chapter of Revelation. It is the fifth church and that church is called Sardis, Sardis. It's the third chapter and it's contained in verses one through six of the book of Revelation. I'm gonna share that with you and we'll begin discussing the church at Sardis. 
uh, as we are uh, moving forward in our study. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter number three. This particular church is not a, is not a, a church that's lost its first love. It's not a, a church that, <clears throat> that is compromising or contaminated. This is a dead church. The church at Sardis, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. The church at Sardis is a dead church. Revelation chapter number three, verse one through six. I'll read it and then we'll begin our discussion. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. That's, we've heard that before. He's said that at just about all the other churches. But listen what he says. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Not quite dead, but almost there. For I have not found thy works perfect before the Lord. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. This is very familiar. We just talked about holding fast with the church of Thyatira. Hold fast but he, and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, that have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white garment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. This is the fifth church. This is the fifth church out of the seven. This is the church that is in the most dire of circumstances. This is a dead church. Now again, when Jesus is having John transcribe his words, there is an actual church in the city of Sardis that existed at the time that John was writing this letter. It was a functioning church. But we don't just simply study this church to learn about history. We study this church to learn about ourselves. Because the same thing that applies to that church or any other church applies to us. We are living in a time today where there are churches that are fully operational, yet they are dead. We are in a time today where we have people who are performing many services and ministries in the church, but they are dead. This fifth letter is to the church in Sardis. Sardis was one of the oldest and best defended cities in the region and the wealthy capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia. And it was only about 30 miles from Thyatira, the city, the church that we just talked about. And because of its location on a major trade route, it was at one time a very wealthy city, wealth was readily prevalent in this city of Sardis. Because of its wealth, the citizens of Sardis lived in relative luxury for their time. And this, unfortunately, led many to moral decline. They could buy what they want, do what they want, 
they could, they could indulge themselves to the limit because there was so much wealth in this city. Many in the city used that wealth for purposes that led to moral decline. In John's time, though, this wealthy city, Sardis, was also known as a wicked city. So let us look at what Jesus says to Sardis. Very, very different from the other churches that we have looked at. For one thing, Jesus is very, very, very condemning. This is the one church out of all the churches that we're going to study where Jesus had nothing good to say. In Thyatira, we just read that at the beginning of the, of the letter, the Lord had some commendation for the things that they were doing that were good. Pergamos, he had some commendation for the things that they were doing for good, that was good. Even Ephesus, the church that had no love, there were some good things that Jesus had to say about that. For Sardis, there was nothing good the Lord had to say. Jesus quickly and clearly condemns. The Lord condemns the lifeless state of this church. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. In verse number one, he says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. What is he saying? Verse number one, chapter number three. We're just going to look at this. The church may have had a name, a good reputation, but in reality, they were spiritually dead. Jesus says, I know what people say about you. I know how you try to portray yourself. I know the reputation that you have in the community. But in spite of everything that people are saying about you, it's what I see in you that matters. You're dead, spiritually. You remember when uh, it was time to choose a king and Samuel went out to Jesse's house went through all of Jesse's sons, looking at each one and saying, this has got to be a king. 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 And in each instance, the vial of oil, which represented the anointing of God, did not flow. When he got down to the end and none of them were anointed, Samuel said to Jesse, God didn't just send me here for no reason. Is there anybody else in your family? Jesse says, well, I got one boy, but he certainly can't be. He's out in the field tending sheep. Samuel says, send, send him. I can't go until I, until I check every one of your boys. And sure enough, when it came time to lift that vial of oil, you know the story, the oil flowed freely on David. And God had to call in to check Samuel and Jesse and people like that. And he said, you look at the outer countenance. I know the heart. Well, that's the case here at Sardis. That's the case at this church. It's the case for many in the church today. You look the part, but your heart is dead. Sardis was doing great things. They had a reputation for doing many things, but spiritually, they were dead. And Jesus called them on it. You can't fool God. He knows the heart. And so the opening words to Sardis in chapter 3, verse number 1, I know thy works and that thou has a name that thou lives and are dead. In other words, the church was filled with people simply going through the motions. Heaven help us. The church was filled with people 
who were simply going through the motions. I'm going to give you two scriptures and we're going to end. I want to give you Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse uh, 25 through 28. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 through 28. Jesus is speaking here in verse number 25, Matthew chapter 23, and Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. In other words, you wash the outside of the glass, but inside, you've got all of this contamination and all of this dirtiness. Verse 26. Thou blind Pharisee, clean first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whited sepulchers like like graves white graves which indeed appear beautiful outwardly like a mausoleum mausoleum beautiful outwardly but are within full of dead men's bones and all the uncleanness even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. What a, what a shame. What, what a shame to, to invest so much effort and time into appearances. And yet within you are dead. How often does this represent people in our time? who spend so much time and effort trying to appear to be presentable, acceptable, successful, influential. And even in the church, we want to look so spiritual, so holy, but yet inside is deadness. This was Sardis. This is some of the people in the church today. Last scripture, Mark chapter number seven, St. Mark chapter number seven, verse six and nine. And we'll end with this. St. Mark chapter number seven, verse six through nine. And it reads, and he answered and said unto them, St. Mark chapter seven, verse six through nine. He answered and said unto them, uh, Excuse me, uh, six through nine. And he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. However, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandments of God you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things you do. And he said unto them, full well, ye reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own traditions. So again, as we close out tonight, um, it isn't simply enough to just do religious things to do good work. It isn't simply enough to have a reputation of being holy if in reality there's nothing on the inside. If, if in reality you do not have the love of Christ in you. And so it is, Sardis was a dead church spiritually, yet it had by all appearances all of these things that made it look like it was successful. 
We're going to close tonight there. Come back next week if the Lord says the same, and we'll begin to look more closely and deeply at uh, what it looks like to be dead on the inside, even while you are active on the outside. I'm going to close now, open up the lines in case there's any questions uh, or comments that we may have from anyone uh, from our um, conference line. Uh, we're going to give an opportunity for those individuals to speak if they wish to do so. All, All right, uh, the lines are open on our conference line. Are there any questions or prayer requests before we close out tonight? Any questions or prayer requests? Yes. Uh, this is Johnny Rice. Yes. I would like to pray, for us to pray for the family of uh, Reverend Calvin Jones. Yes. Transition this past weekend. Thank you. Yes, we will do that. Thank you for for mentioning that. Thank you. All right. Are there any other prayer requests or comments that we may have before we close? Pastor Deacon Calvin. Yes, sir. I would like you to prayers for Dolores Taylor. Um, they're really needed because uh, they're, they've gathered the family. So. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Wes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Any, thank you. Any other prayer needs or prayer requests? Any other comments about our lesson as we close out? Pray for Paul Anderson's family. I see that. And uh, Rhonda, yes, Rhonda uh, Curvin. Yes, we have that. And family. All right. Any other prayer requests? All right. Amen. I'm going to close the line here, and we're going to close out with uh, prayer. God bless you all. All, all right. participants are muted, and they can unmute themselves. Let us pray. Father, our God, we come before you again to ask for mercy to ask you, Lord, for your hand to be upon us. Lord, we are facing so many adversities, challenges, suffering, sickness, death. But Lord, you have promised that those who love you will receive not only an inheritance, but we will share with you in the authority of ruling nations. You said that I promise you will have the bright and morning star. So, Lord, for those of us who are struggling to, to can keep it together, help us to cleave to you. Help us to be like Paul and to say, I will let nothing separate me from the love of God. Life, death, ups and downs, tears. We will let nothing separate us from our love. For you love us unconditionally. You love us eternally. So my prayer tonight is for the Jones family, for Dolores Taylor and her family. Hold them. I pray for Paul Anderson and his family. Rhonda Curvin, having lost her daughter and their family. Pray for Mother Robinson tonight. I pray for Terrence Allen tonight. I pray tonight for Purvis Jenkins' family. And for all the many who have been on our prayer list for a long time. Have mercy tonight, Lord. Please be with them. Give them what they need. And Lord, my prayer tonight is for the kingdom. The kingdom of God everywhere people of faith who are struggling to keep their light shining in the darkest of places. You reminded us in our devotion that it is not simply that our light needs to shine in brightly lit rooms, 
comfortable circumstances, surrounded by loving and caring people in the best of environments. It's not hard to let your light shine then. But you have said, Lord, I want your light to shine when it's darkest, when things hurt the most, when you are surrounded by enemies, when pain is everywhere. It is then that you want our light to shine the brightest. So, Lord, help us to let our light shine. And now, God, if you would just bless us and keep us, this is our prayer. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance on you and give you peace. For he is the true living God who is able to do more than you can ask or even imagine. God bless you. I look forward to our time again next week if the Lord says the same. Continue to lift him up and tell somebody that God is my everything. Be blessed. Good evening.